I am a senior researcher at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture in Cali, Colombia, CIET. Uh, and I'm using climate science to make agriculture smart by helping translate exposure maps into investment plans for value chain actors. So the project that I'm working on most specifically around climate smart value chains is one that focuses principally on tree crops, notably coffee and cocoa. And so the concern in both coffee and cocoa is that climate change is projected to have a significant impact in terms of productivity, in terms of pest and disease, and in some cases in terms of actually being able to produce the crop at all. So what climate science is telling us for coffee and cocoa is that there will be areas that will need to make some modest coping investments, some areas that will need to make some more important transitional investments, and some areas that will probably need to transform out of these crops into others. And so climate science is giving us a clearer picture of where we're going. And since these are agroforestry crops that have a long time horizon, we're able to use this climate science to, to tee up good conversations uh, all the way from farm through to the final purchaser of the agricultural raw material, in this case, coffee or cocoa, um, and begin to have in-depth discussions about, well, what do we do? You know, what does success look like? Success at the farm level looks like more resilient livelihoods that are inclusive and that can be sustained and profitable over time, right? And that are resilient to, to the, the, the changes we're talking about. So that's a very much a farm level sort of you know, success. As you move along the value chain, success morphs a little bit. So if you're a trader, success is maintaining access to a sufficient volume of product to meet the demands of your buyer. And if you're a final brand owner, it's making sure that you still, 20 years from now or 30 years from now, are able to continue to produce your chocolate bars or have coffee in your, in your coffee shops. And so, so success changes somewhat. Um, but nonetheless, these successes have to work together because if they don't, if you fail at the farm level, necessarily you will fail at all other levels, right? And if you fail at the consumer end, you're not gonna have the resources necessary to invest back at the farm level. So it's very much a systemic approach whereby we have to find ways to link these actors and have linked conversations so effectively we're working as a system and not as individuals with each individual trying to maximize their benefit. So it's a question of thinking how do we maximize benefits for us as a system or as a team I like to say rather than how do I maximize my benefits as a producer or as a retailer or as an exporter. We often have closely held assumptions about the linkages between what goes on in the farm and the impacts on the larger landscape. And those assumptions are often poorly examined. Using an approach called participatory system dynamics modeling, we're able to test those assumptions to see if they in fact uh, make sense, uh, are, are, are valid, and if they are not, then it allows us to shift our priorities to where they can have the greatest development outcomes. The gaps we're finding in Ghana, uh, particularly, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I would say that the gaps are not at all around technical issues. So it's not like we don't have the, the necessary technical knowledge or even the necessary technical or CSA practices. Most of those are known. There's been a long, yeah, long history of, of research in Ghana both by, by the Cocoa Research, in, you know, the Cocoa, the Cocoa Research Institute, CRIG, which is part of the, of, of the Ghanaian Cocoa public sector, as well as international centers, as well as uh, you know, other universities and even companies. So there's a lot of information on practices. The gaps we find in Ghana are actually much more at the level of coordination. They're much more at the level of actually getting a broad understanding of what climate change means for cocoa in Ghana. And it's actually trying to get people on the same page and pulling in the same direction. So for example, you know, the work we came in and did, which, and it started with the exposure mapping we did with Krig, And basically it was a question of saying, okay, how do we pick up all of this information, this rich information that you have and layer the climate stuff on top? And then how do we have that conversation with, with the research community, but then with the entire value chain about what does this mean? And, and, and what we found is the gap is really around coordination. It's, a, it's around getting people together and having those conversations. So the gaps in coordination in Ghana are, are basically between the value chain actors. So it's, it's a question of actually, there, there are two pieces there. So the, the gap in information has been sort of the exposure side. So understanding what are the potential effects of climate change in Ghana and doing these exposure maps has, has filled a gap. So there's a knowledge gap that, that, that was initially there that I think we're well on our way to filling. And we've done that in collaboration with, you know, for example, Craig, which is a cocoa research body, uh, and with CocoaBod. So it's been very much trying to build their capacity and their knowledge and their ownership 
of these products. So it's not something we've parachuted in, but something we built with them. Um, and then the other gap that we've been facing is this idea of coordination between different value chain actors. So again, the difficulty there is not on paper because you say, oh, CocoBod manages the sector. They should be able to do all of this. And to some extent, they can convene. convene. But around the issue of climate change, they, 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 they having the international perspective brought in and having this additional information coming in sort of from an actor who's above the daily, you know, the daily grind or above sort of above good and evil, as we like to say, um, has really helped bring people together. And so that's one of the things that we've seen as a gap is how do you bring people together to have a structured conversation around climate change along the value chain, yeah, and avoid some of the, the normal tensions that exist between value chain actors, you know, they're, they're in a commercial relationship oftentimes. So things can be tense. And so having that sort of safe space to talk about climate as a pre-competitive, as, as an issue that affects all of us, has been, has been a, real, a real issue. And also being able to bridge to some extent um, between the cocoa and the ag sector and, for example, the Forestry Commission, right? Because the Forestry Commission is working on mitigation, right? And obviously cocoa and any kind of agroforestry crop has a lot to do with mitigation. So being able to, again, to bridge between sectors uh, and to bring people together to have a structured, uh, you know, open, honest conversation about climate change, avoiding some of the dynamics that oftentimes exist in value chain relationships has been really important. Because we work on coffee and cocoa, not just in Africa, but also in Latin America, and we'll start in Indonesia shortly. So you begin to see that, that globally, the, the, the similar issues globally that we see are, you know, first off, climate change is not uniform. So when you look at climate change and co cocoa, or climate change and coffee in a geography, it's not uniform. There are certain areas that are going to be harder hit, moderately hit, and, and less affected. And so the important thing is how do you understand that and how do you communicate that to the actual value chain actors? So there's a parallel there. There are certainly parallels around potential strategies and practices. Yeah. So what you do in you know, areas that will need to transition out of coffee in Central America is not diff that different than what you can do in, for example, Uganda. Yeah, so there's certain, there's certain strategy or pathways that become similar. Uh, and many times the actors, some of the actors we're talking to, particularly the global players, are active in, in, in many geographies. So you often begin to, begin to have conversations around what does company X do about this kind of an issue um, you know, at a global scale. And, and yes, we can apply that to Western Africa, or we can apply that to Indonesia, or we can apply that to Central America. So when you sit down with the actors in the value chain, ranging from farmers all the way through to you know, the, the exporters, to the, brand, the branded companies, to CocoBod, to Craig, the research center, you know, to the Forestry Commission, all of these different public and private actors, everybody has been super excited about doing this work. And so basically what we're seeing is this kind of project that actually brings in targeted science and helps make sense of it for the actors in the value chain, with the actors in the value chain, not for, with them, because it's a process that we do with the actors, really is filling a gap, okay? Because people are concerned about, value, about, about climate. They're concerned about what's happening. They don't know what to do. And so, so there seems to be a very high level of energy. So when I look at what, what's going forward in Ghana, what really excites me are the conversations we have, for example, with Kwapa Coco, which is a large West, you know, it's a large co-op in Ghana, 100,000 members, cocoa producers. And one of the takeaways we had from, from our meetings with them was, you know, we sat down and showed them sort of the exposure mapping and all this stuff. And they said, oh, so what you're telling us is that we need to have different extension strategies and different extension recommendations depending on what the level of exposure is that our, our members are facing. We said, yes, that's exactly what we're telling you. Oh, we get that. That makes total sense. So what are they? And that leads to a whole another set of conversations. But it's, it's helping to unpack for people, you know, make, you know, take climate change from sort of this very theoretical and sort of abstract idea and make it something that people go, oh, I get it. And with the companies, it's been saying, they say, you know, we've already been doing and we continue to do good agricultural practices. You know, what's the difference? Well, good agricultural practices oftentimes are climate smart. That, so we need to understand that. What's different is we're not talking about blanket recommendations for good agricultural practices. We're talking about taking those good agricultural practices and, and saying, how do they line up to this risk or exposure gradient we have? Where is this practice more, more relevant and where is that practice more relevant, right? Where is pruning or shade management more relevant and where is it less relevant? Where is, you know, grafting most relevant and where is it less relevant? Where does fertilizer, you know, where, where do fertilizer recommendations need to focus and where might you want to do something different? So it's, it's having that kind of a conversation and, and, and helping people understand that they don't start from scratch. They actually can build on what they're already doing. A lot of what they're doing is 
effectively climate smart, uh, but understanding how you align, how you align and how you sort of, I mean, our role is to add value to what people are already doing. You know, and it's basically helping people with science to add value to what they're doing so that they can become more climate resilient. So when you do, when you do value chain interventions, which is what I've done for most of my professional career, um, you, you, you're taught to come at the value chain as a system, right? And, the, and when you talk about interventions in a system, um, you're oftentimes talking about you know, issues around behavioral change, around relationships, around incentives, and around dynamics that are much at a much higher level than the farm. The farm at the end of the day, and what happens at the farm is oftentimes the expression of these kind of issues. So I would say one of the things that practitioners might want to take into account is how do we begin to think about some of these behavioral or, or relationship or incentive shifts as drivers for CSA and, the, and the, the actual result would be adoption of CSA practices at the farm level. And, and I think oftentimes we flip that on its head and we start from the practices and then think, why doesn't it scale? When, when in reality, we should be thinking about what are the, what are the drivers that, that, that lead to change at scale and how can that pull CSA through the system rather than trying to push CSA from the ground up. I think the most important thing here is Climate Smart Ag, if you're talking to a business audience, it's about good business and long-term business. I think probably the main point that I'd like practitioners to take away from this conversation is to understand that climate change can be dealt with and can be dealt with if you bring together actors to look at it and work together.